good afternoon everyone my name is ram kumar i'm part of the founding team of business clinic <clears throat> and i welcome everyone to today's webinar the first 30 minutes will be an overview of business clinic by mr v m rajshekaran and post that the next 1 hour or so will be an interactive session with dr k subramanian on innovation for everyone uh, we plan to finish by 5:30 pm ist so without much further ado let me introduce mr v m rajshekaran who is the founder of business clinic and then uh, invite him to uh, you know uh, do the first portion of the session Uh, Mr Rajshekar is a certified coach for senior management and business leaders. Uh, he is a mentor helping entrepreneurs at the IIT Incubation Center Chennai and at many other institutions like Tai Chennai uh, where he is a charter member. He worked as ITT ITC for more than 32 years retiring as the CEO of the Matches and the Agarbatti division in 2018. Prior to ITC he worked with uh, companies like Vimco, MM Rubber etc. uh he has a chemical engineering degree in uh, in uh, chemical engineering degree and then he has been instrumental in promoting a lot of sustainable development projects in collaboration with many state governments with focus on sustainability and livelihood creation so with that short introduction i'll hand it over to you raj for the taking us through the first section and to inaugurate business cleaning over yep. to you thank you thank you ram uh, thank you very much for a nice crisp introduction Uh, um, first, I think you know. Let me thank all of you for uh, you know taking your time off and uh, attending this uh, interesting session. Um, I understand from Ram that we had over hundred registrations. Honestly, uh, we didn't expect it, but I think it's it's a great start. So the next fifteen to twenty minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, what is this business clinic all about. Give you a background to what we plan to do and how we plan to take it forward. let me tell you before i tell you what business clinic all about is this is not an idea which has been incubated for the last 5 uh, years 6 years 7 years it is just an idea which came to us uh, just about 20 days back you won't believe it from so so from a uh, level of concept to making it a realism today it it's we just got off the ground pretty fast so that uh, i think gives us the confidence that in this country if you have a good idea and if you have a good team like ram and you know and anush supporting him you can make things work very easily and also aggregating the kind of knowledge base what is there in this country the kind of advices when i called them and said please join us let's do something together they they i think there was nobody who said i, I will not join i think thank you very much so with this i'm going to tell you what business clinic is all about and more of this is available in the website but still uh first is you know uh, get an expert expert opinion on specific areas and then there are small scale and medium scale industries who continue to have small small problems but they don't know who to go to and how to get consulted so therefore we thought this is an area which we can come and with the help of uh, advisors we can get, pull in the demand and then give the proper advice so this has really helped us put this idea through and then valuable guidance for specific needs at affordable price see what happens is there are two kinds of consultancy which happens in this country one is uh, a short term for 6 months 7 months another one which runs for 5 years 6 years and both of them are long term projects but if in the meantime if somebody has a small issue you really don't know who to go to so that is where we thought we'd all come in and we tossed this idea with some of the advisors who had joined he said yes it's a good idea so let's you know in the and if ram and me or anush or you know we jo, we just three of us said we'll deal with all the issues i don't think it would be possible so we thought let's take the help of advisors so this is the basic idea behind so what how do we do it so we tell the client please express your needs in a specific format and then we look at who's the appropriate advisor who can help the person and then we contact him we have uh, a sort of a huddle with the advisor we have a chat with him and we also ask some more questions on the through email from the client and we have a huddle with the advisor we said okay this is the way to go so then after that we said we schedule an online session with the advisor and the client post which within 2 hours time we are able to come out with uh, at least 10 very good action let me tell you the the meaning of actionable points is it is not a theoretical uh, uh, structure we are giving okay this is your problem try 1 2 3 which will get you resolved uh, and and then finally after the session is over 
with the help of the advisor, we put it through in a proper action plan document and we send it to the client. Let me tell you, we've done uh, about two, three assignments so far in the last one week. And, and the experience has been uh, fantastic. Uh, we've worked with a couple of advisors and we, we really, the, the, the beauty about the whole thing is it is not a sheer mechanical uh, way of doing things, but bringing the personal touch, which our advisors have done so brilliantly so far. I'm sure, and let me tell you with a lot of uh, pride, there are, I think by today morning, we have another six, seven projects which we have to now start working, looking at uh, advisors and doing it. Now, in terms of you know, specific areas, a range of services, we identified a lot of areas. One is revenue growth, one could be cost reduction, strategy execution, portfolio management, raising capital funding. We got advisors who can deal with mergers and acquisitions, innovation R&D, you want to hear more from Dr. Subramaniam today, sales, marketing, market research, procurement, distribution, logistics, retailing, hospitality, product development, quality, HR. Then analytics, analytics is a, is a big part this year, finance and accounting, operations, customer service, corporate social responsibilities, legal. So now if you, if you really look at, you know, you must be wondering how the hell will these guys, three guys try and you know, help industries with in, in such a vast area. Let me tell you, it is possible with the kind of talent and the creativity we have with the advisor pool we have. And we're always looking out for good quality people who can come and support us in the advisor pool. So having looked at it, the internal team of uh, business clinic, I mean, uh, you can see me in the middle and Ram, he introduced himself and Anush introduced himself. I think uh, so now I think having uh, put the idea through to these two youngsters, I think they're going to take it to great heights. Um, we do a lot of, uh, you know, discussions on every day, you know, every day at 6 p.m. in the evening, we uh, chat up, try to find out. And you won't believe it, the website was put up in a record time of eight days or 10 days. I mean, a lot of interactions and it was uh, done very easily. Okay, now coming to the, the lifeline of Business Clinic. These are our advisors. Ambika, she's an expert in the uh, advertising and market research. Omeo, okay, this is listed in the alphabetical order. Omeo is, again, He's, um, he's got tremendous amount of knowledge and experience in the operations and product development. Atul from ITC again, uh, he, he, he has uh, been instrumental in developing several brands and uh, providing distribution pathways for many ITC brands. Chan, actually he was my boss once upon a time. After that, he headed the uh, notebook business and the greeting cards business. Chand and me have really uh, been uh, running startups in Chennai, so uh, from IDC. So they, we have got a lot of experience as to what happens to a startup business in a multinational. At the same time, how a startup has its banks for growth. The next is John Stephen. John Stephen is uh, again from IDC, He's now with MRF as the chief of HR. Uh, he's got tremendous experience. He was also with, with HR and IR. Krishnan is uh, from Siemens. Uh, as, we, as I told you, we call him the Metro Man. He's got so, uh, about over 30 to 35 years of experience in project management. Uh, Manoj, my, my, who was my neighbor for over 20 years. Manoj, actually, you know, this, this guy was, is, is out and out a hotels man in ITC. He spent all his time in hotels. And finally, during the last part of his career, was handpicked to look after the Six Sigma initiative in hotels. And that's been wonderful. And he was, uh, he was instrumental in the launch of great hotels like Grand Chola, et cetera. Muttu, my great friend. Muttu and I uh, you know, know each other for quite some time. Muttu was the chief general manager of Exim Bank of India. From there, he uh, left uh, the bank and he's now heading the MD of EC Access uh, Finance Company. And more than that, you know, his knowledge base is so wide that he can talk about any subject at any time. So next is Rajan Srikan, again, a good friend, uh, an acquaintance from IIT Madras. He's also the CEO of Keritsu Forum, which is an angel investing company in, uh, based out of Chennai, which Chand, was, Chand is also a member and they, they handpick uh, certain startups and they, they start investing through. So next is me. Uh, next is Rajesh Srivatsav. I, I don't know, Chand may remember Rajesh Srivatsav. Rajesh is... Uh, He's a great uh, brand marketing guy. He was responsible for launching several brands, especially some of the good liquor brands like Signature. And then he had uh, JK Helen Curtis. And you know, he, he, can, he, can, he can teach us the elementary 
details about uh, branding in, in a beautiful way. <laughs> Ramesh is, uh, is a person who has been uh, instrumental in setting up a company from scratch, an entrepreneur, and he set it up and you know, he, uh, he, he took it up to almost 150 crores. After that, he, he has sold the company and is doing extremely well. Right now, he's consulting a few, uh, just few companies. Ram, the young Turk, who's a part of uh, Business Clinic, um, I mean, the guy has got a lot of energy and he can do wonders. I'm sure uh, all of you are going to hear more, more from him and interact with him. Sridhar again uh, from Great Lakes Institute of Management. Very close confidant of uh, Dr. Bala Balachandran. And Sridhar has worked with several projects, including in the Madras Chamber of Commerce and CSR projects. And uh, he can, uh, he, he can you know, really help us in this entire effort. To be Good friend, again, know him for a long time, supply chain expert. He retired from TCS as you know, heading the supply chain initiators. Dr. Subramaniam, I'm, you're going to hear more from him. Uh, he, he, he's a wizard. Actually, the first time I met him was in the incubation clinic in, uh, in, in Chennai, IIT Chennai. And it was very interesting to talk to him. Oh, Mr. Vaidhi Swaran, he, he is one of the doyens of legal and taxation in Chennai. When I requested him and I approached him, He's a contact from Thai Chennai. When I requested him to be an advisor, he said yes. He took a couple of days. He studied our entire model. He said yes, why not? It's a, it's a good thing. Please take me. I will be the guide for you guys in legal and taxation. Sevak, Varendar, we used to call him only Sevak. Varendar is something which we have started calling him now. But I think, you know, this, this guy has got a lot of energy. And, you know, right from the day one, you know, when he was in purchasing and supply chain, he used to drive all the suppliers, including me and Chan, crazy. But after that, he has moved, uh, gone places, and he has done very well for himself. He retired from Nestle as the MD of the Ralston Purina, the pet uh, food uh, division. Now he is with another travel uh, company advising them. So I think we've got a fantastic range of people who, uh, who are with us. And uh, I'm sure every problem, what I told you, can be serviced quite effectively and intelligently. Okay, the, the concept of, of uh, business cleaning, I'm just going back to that uh, for a minute. Uh, it's like, you know, you have a test match, you have a uh, one-day international and you have a T20. This business clinic, what you're saying is uh, entrepreneurs, small-scale industry, the medium-scale industries want quick solutions. And therefore, I think we are tuning ourselves to give them that solution, what they need, rather than giving them an extended lecture. Okay, having looked at it, I think the other thing what we did was we have formed what is called an info X, information multiplied to the power of X is the meaning behind this. This is an initiative of a business clinic. What we're planning to do is you're all members, all the people who are consulting, who are attending Mabira, you're all our honored members. See, what, what happens is this group will meet once a month like this webinar. I think most probably we, we, uh, we will be meeting. Why most probably? Every month on the 15th at 5 p.m., this group will meet. And we'll open it for all of you to come. And every day, every month, we'll share one interesting topic or the other, which will be shared for general knowledge and for common understanding. So what this uh, will do, uh, InfoX part of the business clinics will do, it will conduct webinars, it will uh, engage itself in blogs and also in networking. Abilities. So I think, you know, uh, this is all I wanted to say about business clinic. I, with all your support, I'm sure we'll do extremely well. So now I'm going to hand over to uh, Ram to, uh, from here on to take on the Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Raj. Uh, I, at this point in time, if anybody has any questions about business clinic, I would invite you to kindly type it in the chat box so that I can, uh, you know, uh, take it and then uh, put it to Raj who can then address those questions. Any questions on business clinic or any of the services we provide? I'll just give a couple of minutes. Please feel free to use the chat box to put in your queries. Okay, Raj, Vijay says, great idea, definitely promising. Thank you. <laughs> any questions? Uh... Or, or, or the, maybe one uh, one at a time, we can just take 10, 15. Sure. sure. Mr. Vijay Balaji says, thank you for the introduction. It was clear and crisp. Okay. Harsha is asking, how do the commercial aspects work? 
commercial aspect, uh, aspects, it's not going to be expensive on a case-to-case -case basis we'll decide, but overall, let me tell you, it's going to be a single kind of a rate and it will be affordable. You can talk to it when you, you can call us, me or uh, Rami can give you the details. Yeah, the way it has been decided is that uh, it should be very, very affordable for, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and everybody. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Mr. Gunashekaran is asking, where are the problems to be posted? Oh, the problems, uh, <coughs> you have the, uh, you have uh, our um, uh, website there. If you just go and get started and then schedule a session, you just go there and click. They'll give you a simple questionnaire. In addition to filling up your details, it will ask you three basic questions. What's your problem? What have you done about it? And what do you want? These are the three questions which you have to answer little elaborately. That's where you have to do it. And it's pretty simple and we can send you the link also if you want very specific. I'm just waiting for a couple of more minutes just to see if other questions. Okay. Will the interaction be direct between the clients and the advisors uh, or your team or your team will work as a mediator between the customer and the advisor or do you have a forum for this? Uh, this is a question by Aman. See, the, the current design is all the clients will post their needs on the business clinic side and we have to select who is the best advisor for that then we brief the advisor as we understand the problem and then we get further clarification from the client and then we jointly meet the client. That's how we have designed it to be. And at the end, after the end of the session, if you want to speak to the advisor directly, well, I'm saying we, we won't have any problems about it. But the problem, why, why, the reason why we are, we want to be mediating in between is to ensure there is clarity from both sides and there is, you know, we, we are also uh, give you the best what we can do. Yeah. Yeah, but to be sure, the uh, central part of this is that uh, it's a session that you have directly with the advisor with us mediating in the session. So, yes, there is a direct interaction between the client and the advisor. Yeah, yeah. In the, in the, in this, as Ram said in the session, advisor will be physically and face to face with you. It's not all the time that we are going to be acting as an interpreter. It's not going to be like that. The next question is from Mr. Abhijit Mankame. He says, will you assist from idea to execution? Yeah, why not? I think this session, what you are, uh, what you're going to listen to, uh, Abhijit, is uh, from Dr. Subramaniam, is entirely about R and D and innovation. So you, you are going to hear uh, from one of the advisors yourself. Yeah. Uh, Aman is asking, can I speak as a reply to this? Aman, will it be possible for you to quickly type on chat? I mean, because you would keep it okay. In the sense, will commercials be linked to results? No, uh, right now we are, we are saying we are going to be uh, at the end of the session, we'll be providing you uh, actionable points with due dates and we recommend that you come back for a review once a quarter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Certain things, let me make it very clear. You know, there are a lot of ideas, strategies which can be given. At the end of it, we are not there to run your company. You got to run it the right way, take the advice and move on. So I think, you know, we are available for a quarterly review after that. Yeah. Uh, Vijay is asking, can you share the website link? I have done that on chat. So everybody can see it on chat. Uh, Yadini is asking, can you help us in raising funds? Uh, yes, of course. We can. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. That's a, that's a good point, Yarni. I think uh, uh, Mr. Rajan Srikant, Mr. Muktu Kumaran, uh, they're all experts in uh, helping you guys uh, yes. raise money. Yeah. And Chand also, Chand has got quite a lot of experience. Mr. Chand does. We have uh, quite a lot of advisors who can help you on the subject. Sure. Aman is saying uh, he'll specifically consult us for the session on his question. Sure, Aman. Uh, feel free to contact me or Mr. Yeah. Raj on this. Yeah. Just waiting for a couple of more minutes to check if there are any other questions. Okay, I think uh, that's about it. Please keep sending your questions and we'll uh, take them uh, as they come in, at, as it is appropriate. Uh, we'll now move to the second part of the <coughs> uh, webinar today, to the uh, main topic of innovation for everyone. Uh, I'll just first introduce Dr. Subramanian. So for those of you who do not know him, 
uh, he's what maybe we could call as a serial inventor as in you know he has uh, already filed more than 50 patent applications in his field academically he is a phd from cornell university in electrical engineering with specialization in mems or microelectro mechanical systems uh, he obtained his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from iit madras and he's currently the executive director for research and development at power gear limited in chennai where he works on implementing several novel technologies in so many industries like energy aviation chemicals mechanical sensors and uh, materials and other sectors he previously worked at ge's global research center in new york and he managed a large program on mems at ge and received two prestigious awards for his research uh, dr subramani was also a six sigma black belt he has made significant contributions to many many unique projects and has authored numerous publications and technical reports uh, he relocated back to india 10 years back around 10 years back uh, to you know make his contributions towards uh, making india a r and d and innovation hub for the world so it's a real honor dr subramaniam having you here i welcome you and thank you for doing this webinar for us thank you ram kumar and uh, really appreciate uh, the in invitation for the inaugural session and i really wish business to make uh, the very best starting from today sure sure thank you so much dr subramaniam uh, so i would like to start uh, dr subramaniam with a few questions obviously all of these so what we have done is there are, as a part of the registration process we had requested participants to send in their questions so i have tried to compile a list of questions from that and put them in a certain order uh, what will all, we can also do is all participants can type in their questions as the session proceeds on in the chat box and i'll try to also collate this and try to uh, put it forth to dr subramanian as the session goes uh, in the relevant places so dr subramanian today in the audience when i look at the participants profile we have a wide range you know we have people from msmes as well as from big corporations we have ceos we have former ceos of companies from different industries across sectors so you know looking at the composition of the school and will it be possible for you to please begin by addressing what can r and d and innovation mean to this diverse group of people how do you see it you know how can they use it etc can you maybe begin by, with reference to that sure yeah um i think it's a great question because um uh, r and d means so many things to so many people um uh, to a large majority of people it is a scientist with a french beard wearing glasses sitting in a corner and doing his own stuff or her own stuff right so that is how the movies have caricatured uh, people like us <laughs> uh, in fact uh, when i enrolled in a gym close to my home the uh, trainer was quite shocked that a scientist is actually working out so that is the level of stereotyping that happens so i think i should uh, truly clarify what r and d is what uh, scientists actually do um, especially people like me who are into very applied and practical research where we are into product oriented work which will directly affect or directly become relevant to industry right so with that um so uh, maybe a, a good way to start is uh, whenever we are faced with a problem uh, we get into the mentality of a child right so when you try to explain something to a child uh the child asks keeps on asking the question as to why it works right so you you tell a child not to do something then the question immediately comes back as to why and then you try to explain why and then there is an, another why right for that explanation so we try to do the same thing in r&d whenever there is a something that sounds seemingly impossible right which is where people come to the scientists for a solution we try to ask the question why at least four times one within the other and we try to find a solution for something that is seemingly impossible because if it seemed possible then someone else would have already done it right so i think that is the best definition of innovation to where we solve real problems pressing problems that sound seemingly impossible to start with 
a, a very uh, uh, current problem could you could think of is uh, we have had to go into a lockdown for the coronavirus situation and yet the economy needs to function so it sounds like two very conflicting requirements right uh, i know this is uh, not a very technical example but it's a very real example so a, a, a requirement like that where you need to prevent the spread and you need to run the economy is a classic conflicting problem that which is where an innovator comes in and 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 the innovator refuses to accept that uh, uh, you can only do one and not the other right the uh, the genius comes in finding a solution which will crack both conflicting issues at the same time right and uh, i think r and d beyond innovation is the process so once you innovate you need a process to take you all the way from the idea to the final solution which may be a product if the idea is a technology which may be an implementation if it's if the solution is for example for the covid situation right so this is what innovation is this is what r and d is right maybe i can take a few examples just to kind of excite the imagination in people uh, a few more real life less technical examples for example uh, we have all of us are in india i think most of us on this call are in india and uh, we all have faced a traffic problem in our cities right we have been uh, quite frustrated with the traffic problem right and uh, if you pose a very open question as to how do you solve this traffic problem how do you pack even more vehicles on the road which is inevitable it is bound to happen right so that is something that uh, sounds impossible to start with because the experience is that the roads are already choked right how i mean unless uh, you you kind of uh, pull things down and build bigger roads right which is which will take uh, years or decades to actually happen if if at all it happens what is the next innovative solution right so if you ask this to a set of people I, you will first get uh, a round of obvious solutions maybe people will say sell fewer cars uh, increase the tax on private transport encourage public transport make people follow the road rules right so there may be a lot of uh, obvious answers of this sort right but this is not yet innovative these are all interesting answers but not yet innovative again just to remind so innovation is to solve conflicting problems where uh, the idea is not to reduce the traffic but to keep the traffic and still have the flow right to accommodate the higher traffic in the roads today right so uh, so you you have to think very very differently for example i mean just just to excite people's imagination for example if you have ever seen a, a traffic signal when there is a power cut right and the signal is not working you will actually notice in a very surprising way that there is no accumulation on tra of traffic on all four sides assuming it's a four way signal right what happens at least in india right i'm talking of for this in a very indian situation is when the signals are off people kind of understand each other and find a way right so there is no accumulation of traffic on either of the four sides so this kind of spawns a thought as to whether the solution is the opposite of what we always thought in other words turn off all the traffic signals have uh, in, in the us we have yield signs right in other words in the, the the bigger roads have the right of way the smaller roads come to the intersection just look around at least and yield to the others and then you go but this may be an answer right in, in a city like chennai or any other city in india where uh, thinking of the opposite sometimes actually may may work right uh, and in fact when i gave a college lecture uh, a few months ago uh, i posed this exact problem uh, to the to the students and uh, this i just allowed them to innovate because again students think of crazy ideas and you need crazy ideas for innovation right and uh, one of the very interesting thoughts that came out is if you imagine yourself in a very crowded street if you're walking so let's ignore traffic and cars and vehicles for a second if you're walking right 
you pack a lot of people into a very crowded street because and the reason for that is people are not afraid to hit other people you kind of use your shoulder you shove people aside i think in india we have all learned that art of <laughs> navigating these streets you shove people aside and you find a way and you can actually pack a lot of people in a very small street right and still maintain the flow right so the innovation that came from that audience was what if you make vehicles which are not afraid to hit each other right i'm, I'm again whether this is a practical solution is up for discussion but i'm just telling you what kind of ideas could come up when you use the word innovation right so if you make cars for example out of materials that do not dent or scratch right and materials that are a little flexible just like people right <laughs> then potentially if you see a gap between the two vehicles in front of you you may be tempted to go through that gap at the cost of hitting that person but without damage right so this is uh, this is uh, these are all examples of innovation and uh, for many many problems that we face in india and the world we have to actually think of very crazy solutions like this which are the ones that will ultimately uh solve problems that today are seemingly unsolvable mm. right mm. and another example may be if you think of uh, cities like chennai if you think of the water problem right last year we had a major crisis uh, and uh, there has been a, a message from niti aayog that many many cities in india are going to run out of ground water very very soon i mean in fact they predicted 2020 but hopefully it's a little while away so if you pose such a problem to an innovator the question becomes how do you get water supply to all people without depending on rains without depending on ground water because rains are unpredictable ground water is going to run out right so this again sounds like such a crazy problem that there is no solution to start right so as an example again as a very relatable example for most people uh, people may know that there are innovations happening in extracting water right from the atmosphere right especially in a coastal city where the air is so humid and that feels uncomfortable which is a big negative but you can turn that negative into a positive and say that can i use uh, the sea as an infinite source of water that is constantly replenishing replenishing the humidity in the atmosphere right which is a huge boon because the sun is constantly evaporating the uh, uh, water and uh, it is recharging the humidity in the atmosphere and we need to find a way to get it back right uh, and devices uh, machines are being invented which extract water from the atmosphere and it it, it is it in fact it is pretty good in the sense that uh, you can extract a few thousand liters a day from a machine about 2 meters in size which is plenty for uh, for a household or even for a for a big house right so these are the ideas and and today of course just to add to that uh, such technologies are still a little energy inefficient which means we'll need to find creative ways to get the cost per liter of the water down to reasonable numbers and that is also part of r&d because unless you worry about cost unless you worry about supply chain and all that your r&d is not going to make it to a real application so uh, we'll have to get smart about it right so we'll have to solve one more conflict where we say that let's innovate how do you use uh, the natural evaporation uh, 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 use solar energy for example for instance right uh, to to uh, so so you, so to to get extract water out of the atmosphere you have to actually cool it but solar energy is easier to use for heating something right so maybe the innovative idea would be further heat rather than cool so that the air is so saturated with water that it will precipitate out so there are so many ways to rethink problems right and that i would i believe is the spirit of innovation mm-hmm. right and where many often very often we 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 innovate by imposing severe constraints just like this water problem example where we said okay don't depend on rain don't depend on ground water find a way to supply water to the entire population so if you impose constraints often people will come out with very very creative solutions mm. so i hope these examples kind of reminded people what r and d is yeah. and uh, how innovation happens and it need not be very complicated 
Yeah. It is just something that where you understand the constraints and think very differently outside the box. Yeah. I think these are really wonderful examples of innovations we need at the moment. And some participants agree with you. Uh, Prem Kumar says, it's true that in most places, after adding traffic signals, the traffic has actually increased. So people could easily relate to the examples you gave. And as examples of innovations, we really need at the moment. Uh, on a, uh, you know. uh, now, I just wanted to ask you a question. You spoke about you know, asking four whys, et cetera. Uh, is there like a process or is there a methodology to how to in, how do you innovate? Is there a method to it? Are tools available or is it generally like up to the genius of the inventor, like many people say? So could you, if you could touch upon that, it will be really helpful for people. Yeah. So I, I think today uh, innovation, uh, the, as the saying goes, innovation happens at the intersection of disciplines. So today it's it's very, very difficult for a single person however smart he or she is, to just lock himself up in a room and stare at the ceiling and uh, come up with an idea, right? And uh, so I think, uh, just as I said, the saying goes, innovation happens at the intersection of disciplines, which means you need people of very, very different disciplines working together as a team. So I think that is the first thing that we do. So, uh, and it's amazing how sparks fly when people of vastly different disciplines come together, right? And um, I would say that, uh, for example, even unrelated things, right? For example, uh, if you ask, a, 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 for example, a chemistry expert to sit with a, I don't know, a biotechnology expert, you will find that there are very interesting combination ideas that come up, right? Uh, 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 another example is uh, in, in something that we have personally uh, found uh, interest is where we have seen so many biotech startups come up in India, where they are filled with some amazing biology people, but none of them are engineers, typically, right? So they are all biology people, medical people, right? So you need to make these people sit with real engineers, real scientists on the instrumentation side of medicine, right? So that only then can you invent machines like CT scanners, MRIs, and what is whatever else is coming next, right? So in other words, for example, if you need a, if you again take the current situation, if you need a very cheap test kit for coronavirus, which is accurate and fast, then you will uh, not only need the biology experts, but you will need the sensor people, the uh, the chemists, you will need the electronics because ultimately you need a, an output that is electronic. So all of those skills, when they come together and when they start talking is when this really happens, right? So the second one is kind of what I led into, which is when you impose severe constraints is when innovation happens, uh, is also something we do very often. Uh, I'll give you an example on that line also, where uh, the, so one of the trends today is electric vehicles. Uh, there are initiatives at uh, many governments across the world that they want to move to electric vehicles. But as everyone knows, the biggest bottleneck for electric vehicles is batteries, right? Uh, that is the single biggest thing preventing adoption uh, or reducing adoption of electric vehicles today because uh, there is what is called range anxiety. In other words, when you have a petrol or diesel vehicle, you know that you can go a few hundred kilometers at least and you know there are enough petrol bunks on the way to refill, all of that, that infrastructure is available to you, right? Which is simply not there for electric. So the best, the greatest batteries in the world are not even close to fossil fuel in terms of energy density, which means the mileage that you get out of these vehicles is, is way off, right? So there are some ideas coming up. Can you swap batteries? in, in uh, petrol bunk-like stations? Can you provide charging points in between? But none of them truly address the range anxiety problem, right? So let us say, let us take this example and let us accept the fact that battery technology is about a factor of thousand below where it needs to be in terms of energy density uh, and charging time, which is the other big issue because it takes uh, the best battery in today, it needs about 30 minutes to come to 80% charge. But to fill petrol at a petrol bunk takes five minutes. Nobody has the patience to wait for 30 minutes, right? So uh, let us take this as, a as an example. So if you impose a very severe constraint, 
saying that uh, I'm going to live with today's batteries, right? But I still want electric vehicles, right? Or you make the constraint worse that, okay, I'm, going to, I, I'm not going to use a battery. I want an innovation where I want an electric vehicle that doesn't use a battery because battery technology needs several years to come up to where I need it to be, right? So the minute you impose that constraint, then I'm sure a lot of the audience probably here have started innovating already, right? You may think of alternative solution, which doesn't have batteries, right? For example, the roads would have inbuilt electrical induction. So just like electric trains, right? So we kind of forget the fact that the railways went electric several decades ago and they don't have batteries in the trains, right? I mean, maybe they have batteries for a few things, but the main primary traction is from a 25 kilovolt line that runs over it, right? So it is possible to have electric vehicles without batteries, right? So there are options, right? So you, maybe you can induce power from the road. Maybe you can induce power from something overhead. So there may be other options that people may innovate the minute you say that you should not have a battery and then you get bonus advantages. For example, the battery is a very heavy thing in the vehicle. It's probably the heaviest thing in the vehicle, right? So when you throw out the battery, you probably get a lot more mileage just because you've thrown out something so massive, right? Right, so that way, I mean, I think imposing constraints is, is a big thing that we do to prompt people to innovate. Of course, find the final innovation comes from people's brains. The other technique we use is we drill down to the fundamentals a lot. We drill down to the fundamentals significantly. So uh, as I said, we keep asking the question, why, 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 why? And finally, you come up to a very fundamental question, right? Uh, and uh, in the same electric vehicle example, uh, a very fundamental question actually is, do you really need a bigger battery to go a longer distance? And the answer is actually no. It is a popular misconception that you need a bigger battery to go a longer distance because the Newton's second law just simply tells you that force is mass times acceleration, right? Uh, mass is important, so the lighter the vehicle is, the longer you can go. But you need to use energy from the battery only when you're accelerating. That is what the fundamental physics actually tells you, right? So rather than build a bigger battery, rather than build a more expensive battery, if you could figure out a way to allow acceleration only where acceleration is required, is truly required, if that intelligence is there in the control system of the vehicle. That alone will get you a lot more mileage. Okay, this is the power of going down to the fundamentals, right? So we have found so much, uh, so much in, in uh, going to the fundamentals. For example, we are working on a project on an alternatives to batteries. Right? where we want to store energy on a single piece of metal. It sounds a completely wild idea in the sense that you just have a piece of metal. Right? And if you go down to the very fundamentals, there, are, there were experiments that happened 200 years ago where people put gold leaves inside uh, glass jars and try to, try to charge those things. And they actually proved that you can store charge on just a, a gold leaf. And uh, why was it a gold leaf? Because gold can be made into very thin leaves. That is the only reason they used gold. So you can actually use any metal. So we have actually, yeah, we're working on an active project where there is just a single piece of metal. There is no chemistry at all. And the way you, if you pump electrons into it, you will, it will hold charge and it becomes something which is the equivalent of a battery. And electrons move way faster than ions because batteries use chemistry, chemistry uses ions, which are slow which is why charging and discharge charging is a slow process today. It takes two hours to charge your cell phone, right? And the best cell phones take one hour to charge, right? But with this, this technology actually works and theoretically it can, the charging time is theoretically instantaneous. Practically it will be about 10 or 20 seconds, right? Which revolutionizes the world of energy storage, right? So those are just a few examples, right? Uh, of, of going to the fundamentals and questioning. So when I was a, when I was a high school kid, I, uh, and my first lesson in electricity came up, I had this nagging question in my mind. Why do you need a plus and a minus to complete a circuit? So your teachers always told you, you have to complete a circuit. You'll have to start from the plus and end up in the minus. 
right and i was too afraid to ask the question what happens if you just have an open ended wire from one end of the battery right i, I mean i i always thought the answer was that it won't work right but then uh, whoever asked that question which was probably more than a century ago uh, invented antennas because antennas are exactly that they are a single wire from one end of a power source which is completely open ended and you don't complete a circuit that is how wireless transmission actually happens today right so there are so many things to be gained by asking the most dumb the most fundamental questions which is another way to innovate and finally there is there are actually some tools on how innovation happens there is a tool called uh, triz it is it is spelled t r i z it's it's a russian acronym that stands for theory of inventive problem solving it's it the acronym acronym is in russian uh so what these people have done is a very smart thing uh, it is just a tool to ensure that you don't reinvent what has already been invented and the belief is that if you have a problem there is a very high chance that there is a solution that already exists so what this tool does is it, it is simply a database of a lot of patents that have been filed for the last i believe 200 years or so since the beginning of patenting so they have collected all of that they have tried to abstract all those patterns into conflicting problems right so when we are when in in innovation when we are faced with a conflicting problem uh we can actually there is a big table in that tool which you can look up and it tells you how else other people have solved those problems for other applications right a very simple example would be when you make something stronger when you do mechanical design when you make something stronger it usually becomes heavier because you beef up the dimensions to make it stronger right but if you have a face to the problem that says i want to make it stronger but lighter which is a classic conflict you can go to the tool you can look up strong versus light and it will tell you how all people in the past have solved this problem one very simple solution maybe you drill holes in a few places in in non in less important places you drill some holes remove some material make it lighter right so it will give you suggestions like this so there are also tools like this which help you innovate right in the sense that it will be an innovation for your problem in question but it may not be an innovation for something that the and another problem that it was already applied for right but there is no need to reinvent the wheel because it has already been solved for some so there are many many such examples but i think i'll stop here and take the next question sure thank you so much for that it was uh, uh, really a uh, you know step by step elaborate answer to that and if you could just summarize you said innovation happens when you bring together people from multiple disciplines together then you whenever you impose constraints you said it leads to more innovation and you said we have to drill down to the fundamentals and also ask very very fundamental questions ask uh, sometimes it may seem dumb but we need to ask really fundamental questions and then finally there are many tools and methodologies that are actually available to facilitate the whole process of innovation so uh, thank you so much for that uh, dr subramanian i mean you head this um, organization pavagi r&d where you provide r&d and innovation services you do r&d and innovation services for so many companies across sectors um, will it be possible for you to maybe take us through you know what do you really do there how do you help companies because i think a lot of the people in this call you know either maybe trying to innovate on something or you know uh, they may need services in the future whatever so will it be possible for you to do that and then i already have some questions coming on the chat so i'm taking making note of them uh, other participants who may want to ask any questions please feel free to write in chat and we'll try to take up as many questions as possible so over to you dr sorony if you could also give us some examples some case studies of companies you have worked with and help them innovate it will be like really helpful Sure. So I think, given the number of questions that are coming through, maybe after I answer this and uh, describe a little bit of Power Gear and what we do, we can take some of the questions from the audience. Yeah. So um, at Power Gear, we are the extended R and D lab of other companies. That is, in a nutshell, what we are. Hmm. Right. So if there is a company that, or there is, uh, it could be a startup, it could be a mid-sized company, it could be a, a very large multinational. they may have an internal r and d facility they may not have r and d at all in any of these cases we become their r and d team or or at least we become an extension of their r and d team in other words uh, another way to put it 
is I think everybody has is in the world is realizing that R and D is required. Uh, you, we may be comfortable manufacturing something, producing something, making money today, but unless we innovate, it is inevitable that any line of business a few years down the line, uh, it is inevitable that we will probably be out of business unless we innovate, because otherwise somebody else will come and innovate and take over the market. So that realization has come in, and hence almost everyone is heading towards uh, a vision where they are trying to describe what uh, they, where they want to be in the market, either one year or three years or five years or 10 years from now, right? The larger the company, usually the longer term the vision. For example, uh, Boeing is one of our customers and we are working with them on some very long term visions, which are more than 10, 12 years down the line, in addition to some of the shorter term visions. So, um, so for R&D, you need a vision, and of course you need a budget, but if you have these two, I think we are there to do the work. So that is what we provide, right? So I think even in terms of engaging with business clinic, uh, the first session will be a very interesting session where we can brainstorm with the client as to what they want in terms of innovation and how potentially it can be approached. But then we can also become their R&D team and do a much longer term assignment which is again success based. I think someone had that question. We typically split it into milestones and make it success based and actually implement the innovation for them. When I say implement, it is not just on paper. It starts on paper as a concept. Uh, there is even the business case that is studied around it. The intellectual property patent situation is studied. The experiments are performed to figure out which concept may actually work. And then the actual prototype is built and all the latter phases of R&D as well, which is how much is it going to cost? How do you reduce the cost? How do you make the product reliable? What is the supply chain for the product, right? How do you make it manufacturable? All of those services are provided, which, which covers the R and the D of R&D, right? So that is in a nutshell what we do. So this slide that is showing here is just uh, the, the technical um, split of the skills that we bring to the table. And we believe this covers a very large portion of what is required. And the next slide that has just changed is how these technical skills map into the applications. So if you could just go back to the previous slide for a minute, I will just explain that. So the previous slide had, yeah. So just to quickly go over this, uh, there are teams that are available in electronics, in power, in chemicals, in, in novel materials, in, in sensors, uh, embedded systems, high power, electromagnetics, optics. So all of these are actually within themselves pretty big words, right? Because if you take sensors, for example, sensors itself is such a broad word that you can have so many different kinds of sensors today, right? A lot of sensors exist. A lot of sensors are yet to be invented. So we work on projects where people come to us where there are sensors that they need, very specialized sensors, which are, which are simply not available in the market today. For example, uh, uh, if you take a very, the most basic sensor, which is a temperature sensor, right? We all know it as a thermometer uh, and we've all used it when we got sick, uh, but that is just one kind of a temperature sensor, right? Uh, as a case study, we are working with an automobile company that wants to put a temperature sensor on a certain part of the automobile engine. Okay, because they, the temperature of that particular spot actually gives them a lot of information on the reliability of that engine and how it fails, right? And the very interesting challenge is that the spot is a very, very, very small place to put that sensor. So you'll have to design a temperature sensor that's extremely tiny. The second challenge in that application is that uh, the uh, the ambient temperature around is of the order of 1,200 degrees Celsius because it's very close to the combustion chamber of the engine, right? And uh, so you need materials to make the sensor. You can't make it out of conventional materials. We'll have to innovate and create materials uh, which survive at this kind of temperature. Thirdly, the sensor by itself is useless unless you have electronics that gives you a readout. And no electronics works at that kind of temperature. 
right? You, the best you can push electronics today is about 125 degrees Celsius uh, or a little more if you really try, but, but nowhere near 1,000 plus degrees Celsius. So uh, it becomes a very unique challenge, right? So how do you convert the signal that's coming out of the sensor into a readable output? So all of these are very interesting challenges, which so people come to us to invent things like this, right? So uh, that is a very classic example. On the first, on top left, we have an example of a, an electric vehicle drivetrain. We're looking at the rear wheel uh, uh, chassis. So we actually do projects where we invent new kinds of motors, new kinds of controllers for the motors. Uh, uh, you may know that uh, uh, a lot of the uh, motors that go on electric vehicles today are actually brushless DC motors, which use high strength permanent magnets. And the source for these high strength permanent magnets is exclusively in China today. So there are a lot of indigenous requirements where we need to indigenously develop motors which don't have these kinds of permanent magnets, okay? So there are technologies out there. I mean, uh, namely one of them is called SRM or switched reluctance machines, which use windings on both the stator and the rotor and no permanent magnets at all. So that is an example of some incremental innovation, but we are also working on a project where we are making a motor which has neither permanent magnets nor copper windings, right? So no windings, no, no permanent magnets, no electromagnets or permanent magnets, which means the motor itself does not function in a magnetic kind of physics. It uses a completely different principle to operate. So that is an example of a little more longer term interesting innovation, right? If you just could just go to the next slide, it shows all the uh, applications that we work on. So the various technologies that I described in the previous uh, slide map onto these applications, right? For example, we are, uh, we just wrote a proposal for a dialysis equipment, which falls in the medical field. And you may know that no dialysis equipment is actually built in India today. Uh, and the other shocking thing about dialysis is that people in small towns and rural areas don't have access to dialysis. So if they are in that stage of kidney disease, they actually need to travel to a bigger town uh, about three times a week, at least three or four times a week and spend uh, time in that town in a hospital for about four to six hours for a complete dialysis session. So this is a fairly cruel thing because they just don't have access to dialysis. So we are working on a, we just worked on a proposal on a portable dialysis machine where the dialysis machine itself can be ported to these small towns and villages. So we're very proud of this. Uh, also, uh, I mean, it, it is also a business case, right, for the uh, for our customer because uh, it opens up a whole new market in terms of rural and small town areas for dialysis where it just simply doesn't exist, right? And a very interesting challenge in this project was, uh, in fact, mini miniaturizing the machine to make it portable is, is by itself an interesting challenge, but uh, a, a very non-obvious challenge is dialysis as a process needs 400 liters of clean water per session. And this is not a small number. So even if the machine is portable, where do you find 400 liters of clean water at the remote location, right? So that is another challenge we had to tackle, right? So uh, version one is going to provide 400 liters of clean water. Version two is going to get closer to the real human kidney, which believe it or not uses only two liters of water a day versus 400. So the miracle of nature is something we are still very, very far away from in terms of meeting, right? So this, these are other examples. So in energy, we work in smart grid and aerospace. We work on so many different materials, sensors, et cetera. So we have a very wide reach. I'll give you another consumer level example. There is a project uh, which is again, very relatable where someone came to us and said, can you make us the opposite of a microwave oven? So that's literally what they said, the opposite of a microwave oven. In other words, they want something that looks like a microwave oven. It has to look a box of the same size. It has to have a door. You put a beverage inside, you set two minutes, except instead of becoming hot, it has to become chill. So if you think about it, it's actually a great business idea where there is no solution today that can actually cool something in, at such a rapid rate in two minutes going from room temperature to a very low temperature. So obviously it has nothing to do with microwaves, but uh, what we do in this situation is we assemble a team of relevant scientists. We brainstorm what technologies can potentially be used to cool something so rapidly. 
Out of that, which ones can be cost effective for a consumer application? Then we experiment with it and actually make a prototype. So these are a few examples. Yeah, I think we'll skip some of these slides for now. We can just go to the questions. We can return to the slides as and when relevant. Sure. So there are a few questions uh, around the COVID situation. So I'll just probably read out a couple of questions and then you can answer them. So Mr. Chandas has asked, how can we sustain the innovation ecosystem that has come together for COVID? He feels that more has been done in the past 60 days than in the past 60 years. Uh, Rohit from KPMG is asking, how can innovation be harnessed in times of crisis, such as the current COVID-19 pandemic? Mr. Soundar Rajan is asking, what are the challenges and opportunities for innovation post-COVID? So these are a few questions that have come around the pandemic and scenario around that. Yeah, great, very great questions. Uh, so I think I will start by a repeating an obvious proverb, which is, says that necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, I, and I don't think there is any greater driver for innovation like necessity. So I think the COVID situation has demonstrated that. We have, I, it, has, it, has, it has become obvious that to tackle the COVID situation, certain inventions were necessary. Uh, and that is why these inventions happened. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I, I believe Gandhi invented non-violent non-cooperation because at that time it was necessary, right? Because that necessity wasn't there, that would not have been, that was really a classic innovation to fight the British. So uh, my, my humble suggestion to the persons who asked this question would be to challenge them, to challenge these companies on how to create a necessity to invent within their organization, right? So even after COVID, hopefully COVID situation goes away quickly, but even after that, how do you sustain this uh, burning necessity to invent, which is really something that's need, need, that needs to be driven at the leadership level. The leadership has to incentivize everything based on innovation. Right? And when I say innovation, I'm not, not just talking about coming up with ideas, but going all the way, right? coming up with ideas and, and literally seeing it through to real new technology, new product launches. That is a measure of success, right? So you make it, uh, so people have to, uh, people can't, should not be able to survive within the organization unless they innovate, right? So this necessity should clearly be created and people should be given targets that uh, unless, I mean, innovation does, is not always technical, right? But it could also be on cost, for instance, right? And, and this is something that always happens in organizations because customers are driving costs down year over year for the same product and uh, worker wages, overheads, et cetera, are going up, right? So selling, uh, doing the same thing, you will actually keep losing your margin year over year, Right, so that alone is an innovation problem. How do you constantly innovate and reduce the internal cost of your product uh, so that you keep your margins alive? Right, so I think creating the necessity is something that will create, uh, do wonders. And I don't think we're doing enough of that. Uh, there are a set of questions. Uh, I'm just taking this next because there are so many questions around this topic of innovation in India. So I'll just read out a few questions. Mr. V.K. Krishnan asked, why are we as Indians so low on innovation? Um, then Bhargavi asked, how can someone fast track patent approval in India? Uh, and right now in the session, for example, Mr. Varindra Sevak asked, how can we start getting outsourcing of highest technology that we started to discuss at the beginning of this meeting, are resources available for that? And then there's one question from Vijay Balaji. It's a, quite a long question, but if I have to summarize it, He's talking about innovation in the agri sector. Uh, he's handling agri business entities. So while I don't want to get very sector specific, I mean, uh, right now, but he's saying uh, with res uh, respect to innovation, he's asking that, uh, you know, he's comparing innovation in India and China. Uh, so uh, basically the questions are around what can help us innovate better? Is a mindset change required? What could be the roadmap for us in India? These are some of the questions broadly that a lot of people are asking. 
Okay, I think there are a lot of broad questions, right? Uh, but I would actually agree with the fact that um, uh, there is not a lot of drive for innovation in India, honestly, to be perfectly honest. Because even um, after we started this business of becoming an R&D lab of other people, it was a little bit of an uphill battle to convince Indian customers to do R&D, right? Foreign customers was a little easier. Um, Indian customers, uh, uh, I'm not generalizing, but broadly speaking, the thinking was that why take the risk and invest in, in research? Because there is risk, to be frank. Why not we just wait? Somebody else will invent the technology and uh, we will buy it. We will acquire the technology at that time. So this right or wrong is, seems to be the most common thinking in many, many Indian companies, and I don't want to just restrict it to India, I'm sure it exists in other countries as well. Uh, but uh, the inclination towards organic growth, right, through innovating, creating your own technologies doesn't exist a lot, honestly. And I, I'm not saying that it, it is wrong to acquire technology and grow through acquisitions. I think that is also a very healthy way to grow. But I think you need a proper mix of organic growth and acquisition. Right? Because unless you have organic growth, or, or rather I would put it this way, if you have organic growth, organic growth spawns more organic growth. Because once you've invented a technology, you get the confidence. You know how to innovate. Right? And from there, there will be offshoots that come up that you may have never realized in the past. Right? So somehow we have not gotten into this mode yet. We are willing to pay more to acquire a technology that at a later stage, to so avoid the risk of developing it at an early stage. So if you do it in an early stage, you actually spend a lot less, but you're taking on more risk. So it's always that risk versus reward equation. So I think it boils down to this risk-taking appetite. I think that's what it boils down. If we are if we are more willing to take risks, we will be yeah. more willing to invest. And then when we are more willing to invest, there will be more innovations that come. But then I think there is starting to be a push at the government level. Um, not a lot, because government is still funding research primarily in academic environments. Uh, they need to start funding. There are programs like TDF, the Technology Development Fund of the DRDO, which specifically funds <clears throat> R&D in MSMEs. Uh, and these are 10 crore buckets per project, which specifically fund uh, R&D for MSMEs, which encourage industry to innovate and eventually, of course, supply to the Indian defense. And the, uh, the goal is, once you do this, that those companies will become so strong in those products. And again, as I said earlier, that those innovations will spawn further innovations laterally. Right? So there has to be a mindset change. Uh, sometimes mindset changes need, need to be forced. Right? Uh, uh, as an example, um, when I was working for GE in the US, the way GE was organized, I'm talking about more than 10 years ago, was well, at that time, the company was incredibly diverse. They had many, many business units. They had made plastics, they made aircraft engines, they made medical equipment like CT and MRI. They, they made the King Kong movie, Universal Studios were owned, was owned by GE. So they were so incredibly diverse and all of these diverse business units would come to us, the central research lab, to ask for their next generation innovation. But then this was... This was, yes, it was, it was a necessity, but it was also partly forced because uh, for lack of a better word, all of these business units were forced to pay uh, some, for lack of a better word, an R&D tax to the central corporate entity of the company, right? So if we can do something like that, sometimes you have to force to initiate the process, right? Just like CSR, if you say that a certain percentage of your revenue has to be spent on research, Right, which will of course only go back to you, it'll help you, right? Um, something like that may kickstart the process and then tune Indian entities, make them more familiar with the advantages of doing r and d I hope I answered at least some of those questions. I know there were a lot of questions. So. Certainly, yeah, there were a lot of questions. In fact, there are some follow-up questions like Mr. Chandas is asking, during COVID, the entire innovation ecosystem of the government, like the regulators, academia, startups, industry, seem to have come together with speed. Uh, is this really sustainable post-COVID? Um, 
I, I'm not able to answer that in, in, in its entirety because um, I have a feeling being in the R&D business, I have a feeling that a lot of it was also press, right? Um, because as, uh, as an R&D service provider, we actually could not do much work in the COVID situation because of the lockdowns. And uh, it was not uh, obvious how we could even get permissions for this kind of activity. So yes, we, have, we were seeing in the news that a few institutions are actually making ventilators, making masks, making some detection devices. Uh, but I don't know how they were doing it because we, we actually tried very hard to find a way to uh, get some resources together, uh, actually get people together to do something, but it was not possible. So I don't know if it, how real the portrayal in the press, I'm just being very frank here, was, right? Um, and uh, it's very hard for us to comment on that because of that reason, right? But it is true that there were government funding calls that came. I think the government realized that uh, COVID is not one of a kind. There will be more COVID equivalents coming in the future Right, so they actually were calls for proposals, and we have responded to one of them for uh, broad-based detection kits and all that, which could potentially be adapted to uh, future COVID-like situations as well. Right, so for low cost, we actually wrote a proposal where, along with a local a college, uh, where uh, you could do detection purely based on saliva, rather than drawing blood. Right. Uh, so uh, things like that, right? Which could uh, potentially expandable to future COVID-like situations. So those kinds of things are real and we have actually participated in those things, though the, even the responses to our proposals have not yet come. Uh, I think the government, to be fair, is very busy tackling the situation at the ground level. Uh, but I don't know how much actually happened in the lockdown period. There are some questions around IP. Uh, one, one of the question is, how do you handle IP transfer? There was a question earlier in the session which said, uh, the prototypes that you develop for clients, who owns this? So could you address the, uh, the, the topic of IP in general? And yeah, so uh, when I was at the other end, you know, when I was working as a scientist and when I used to outsource R&D work, uh, uh, me or, or rather my company used to insist that we own the IP because we are paying for the project. So I wanted to keep the situation as simple as that when we started this service. So it is a very clean model where the entire IP is completely assigned to the customer. So our belief is that whoever is paying for the R&D work, which is the customer, uh, the output of the R&D, which is the prototypes, the IP, all of that should belong to them because they are paying for that, right? So we have a very clean model. So there is often hardly any discussion on IP because we don't claim any any ownership of it. Sure. Uh, um, there are uh, some points around uh, how government at a top level provide quick idea. So I'm not taking all of that. There are uh, some questions around uh, India's position in the world as an innovator. So do you want to take that? I mean, I, I know you address some uh, aspects of that, but. What is India's position in the world currently with respect to innovation? Yeah. So I think the, the brains are there, right? I think we all agree. Uh, definitely we have the capability to innovate for the world, not just for India, but for the world. Um, the question is to bring the brains together, make them focus and make them focus towards a very clearly defined project. And in industry, how we work is we don't invent something and then wait for an application. We uh, start from the market, or rather when we work for, from, for a client, we ask the client, what is your understanding of the market? What is your vision? What do you want to launch in the market in the coming years, right? What do you think you can make money out of? And from there, we work backwards to say that, okay, in three years, you want something, you want this new technology to be launched. So hence this year, this uh, particular uh, R&D project has to be launched for you, right? Only then you have some hope of hitting your three-year timeline, right? So that is how industry works in research, right? So in other words, when you're finished inventing, the market is ready. You're not looking for an application at that time. Application is ready because you started from the application. 
Okay. So, um, uh, can you would you mind repeating your question so that I have a pointed answer to that? Sir? Yeah. So basically, the answer was, what is India's position in the world in terms of innovation? So I think uh, India is known, fortunately, thanks to the IT companies, as a, as an outsourcing destination. Right, that aura has been built, and we have been good at that. Right, uh, India has also been known as a land of smart people because uh, a lot of Indian scientists working abroad have uh, uh, done very well. Uh, Indian scientists working in India are working in captive R&D labs. So, in other words, if a multinational company like GE or Boeing or whichever company you name it, has an R&D outfit in India. It is a captive R&D outfit. So they trust that certain innovations can come from India, but there is no trust to the extent that you can farm it out as an open source model. Right? Uh, in other words, they have a very close-knit team which they control, and it happens within that team, their own captive team in India or in their facility abroad. Right? Uh, so I think we are trying to move, push it to the next generation, push it to the next level, where we are saying that uh, uh, a broad-based team like what we offer, which works, cuts across skills, cuts across industry, right, can actually help you all the more in multiple ways. One, in, one is in commercial ways, because you don't need to develop a major headcount. You can outsource such some of your research needs. Secondly, you have access to a broader skill set, right? You may have certain core skills that are close to your heart, and yeah, feel free to develop those core skills internally, but a lot of the adjacent skills you may not need to hire. You can farm it out, you can outsource, right? Thirdly, the fact that you're tapping into a team which has worked across many domains, right? We can actually pull in examples of similar problems on other domains and help you innovate all the more because of that. Right, so I think we are trying to push India to the next level in a small way but it's the water, drops of water that make the ocean, right? Definitely, definitely. <laughs> and, uh, and to be really frank, I think you need like a hundred companies like us to mm. come up to tr truly take India to that level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there are about five or six questions, Dr. Subramanian, on the mindset. So people are asking that, I mean, how do we, I mean, is there a change in mindset? That, for example, Dr. Sivakumar, uh, he runs his own, uh, you know, center, hospital and center. He's asking, uh, should we uh, change our focus and mindset from focus on low cost, uh, uh, rather move it to quality? Professor Sridhar is asking, do we need an innovation in the education system itself to make us to be on the top of research? Uh, there are other people who are also asking, what are the kind of changes in mindset that are required to really propel us up there? Okay, excellent questions. I think uh, the first question was the doctor's question, right? Uh, uh, I think the human body is the same, whether it's a Western body or an Eastern body. So I think quality, of course, is there. Uh, we are also cost conscious. I think we'll have to, uh, as I said very early on in the talk, uh, when we hit that conflict, is it quality or cost? I think we need to say, you know, we need both. We need quality at low cost, right? Which is where the innovator comes. And I think it is possible to do both, right? And uh, to his point, I think uh, uh, maybe if, if it helps, we are, we are working on multiple projects with doctors, right? One I mentioned was in dialysis. Uh, we, we worked with uh, another team on uh, developing a very miniature PCR machine. PCR is a DNA analysis machine, which is also kind of the, 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 uh, the fundamental way the, the COVID detection systems work. But we developed it for a different application uh, some time ago. We are working with a doctor in Madurai, um, who is an orthopedic surgeon, uh, who has developed um, uh, a way to heal fractures much faster uh, through a certain filling material. And uh, we're working with him on that because it's not just the material, it is also how to, for example, 3D print the material in various shapes to customize it for different uh, fractures. Uh, lots of very interesting work coming out of the medical field. I mean, the medical field, I would say, is even as as a, as a as humanity, we have just scratched the surface of uh, the human what we know about the human body. Right? There is so much left to invent. I mean, as a mechanical engineering, I would say the field is saturating, but medical is anything but. <laughs> right? Uh, there's so much innovation yeah. to do. 
that uh, I think any any project we pick, we find that uh, uh, there is a lot to do. And in fact, it is also true that almost no medical equipment is made in India today. So that is another cause we have to serve. So even equipment that is imported, where we are fleeced on the cost of the equipment and more on the cost of the spare parts, uh, I think all of those have to be indigenized. And uh, when I say indigenized, it is not just uh, copying it, but maybe replicating it to some extent, but also innovating and improving it when we make it in India. Right? Uh, well, there is a question on the cultural factors restricting our innovation abilities and on whether there is an innovation required in the education system itself, you know, kind of bring us to the top. So Yeah, uh, it's a very, very broad, big question to answer. Um, I think things have changed a lot. My son today goes to uh, gadget making competitions, which were unheard of when I was in school. Right? When I was in school, uh, a maximum we used to go to some quiz competition, right? which was more on general knowledge and all that. <laughs> Uh, but And there was no emphasis on hands-on work at that time. But now a gadget making competition is something that is, I mean, really, I mean, you will have to know the fundamentals. You will have to also do things hands-on, right? Um, I took uh, both my children to uh, uh, Dr. Sivan Aman's actual house in Bangalore, where there was a competition of a similar nature, where they gave them uh, tools uh, or a material right there and asked them to make something belonging to a certain concept in physics. So a lot of changes are happening. So I don't want to shoot down the system entirely. But yes, I think we are still stuck in the, uh, in the idea of exams and uh, idea of marks, right? Uh, which has some merit because, I mean, we are a huge population that needs to be a way to filter out people. But uh, I think there is a little bit less emphasis on fundamentals. Right? Because even today, when I interview an engineering student, and when we recruit people, we are not restricted to PhDs or anything like that, or even to any particular college or brand name. Right? We take people who have an inclination for research. We take people who have a thorough understanding of the fundamentals. Right? But that is something we feel is lacking. Right? It's very hard to get people with a strong knowledge of the fundamentals, which I think the education system should infuse. I gave a talk at a college uh, recently, uh, this is at a college uh, audience where the audience that was composed of students and faculty. And then I started my talk with a very simple question on, if you remember, you go back to seventh standard in school, uh, people taught, taught you how to construct a 60 degree angle with ruler and compass. I, I don't know how many people remember that <laughs> in this audience, but use a ruler and compass, no protractor, construct a 60 degree angle. It is the first thing that they teach you in geometry, right? And you actually have to draw two arcs with your compass if you recollect that problem. But nobody taught you in seventh standard why that construction technique produces a 60 degree angle. And that is where we started mugging up, right? When the first theorems were taught and without explaining why it works, Right. Even today, that, that audience, there were hardly one or two people who were able to answer and tell me why that technique actually worked and produced 60 degrees. Right. So that is where it starts. Right. Uh, and then I, I, I went on to ask many questions on fundamentals, and it kind of was an eye-opener for many people. All right. If you take, for example, many things that teach you in physics, like the second law of thermodynamics, which talks about uh, entropy and all that, uh, very, very few teachers, I believe, actually truly understand and are able to explain it and do justice. Right? So unfortunately, yes, I think the answer is yes, we will have to need a huge revolution in the education system. We need much better paid teachers, teachers who have a passion for teaching and teachers who truly understand the fundamentals so that they can excite the students and teachers who can teach hands-on, all of which is the order of the day. Great. great. That, that's really great. Yeah. We have around three minutes and I have a lot of sector specific questions, which obviously will be difficult to address and we need separate sessions by themselves. There are two fundamental buckets of questions. If you could just help answer those, there are a lot of CEOs here who run their own companies, uh, MSMEs, uh, you know, so they are asking what step can the leadership team of MSMEs take with respect to R and D and innovation. There's also a question from academicians like Professor Sridhar on the same lines. Um, and as, uh, the C one of some of the CEOs are asking, how do we innovate then with limited resources? 
that are there at our disposal. Okay. Um, I think I will start in reverse because I think the question of innovating with limited resources may answer some of the other questions. Sure. Um, again, uh, I refuse to agree that resources are just money. Okay, often when we say limited resources, I think we have to define resources. Resources can be money, it can be skills, it can be vision, or it can be time. Okay, so today, if, 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 if the money is available and the vision is available, right? So if people know what they want, and if they have a, a budget to fund it, yes, a budget is required. I mean, everybody needs to get paid. But if that, if that is there, the other resources are available. So there is actually a very good innovation ecosystem in India, in various parts of India. Okay. So, and this ecosystem comprises of academic institutions. IIT has a research park, for instance, which encourages collaboration with IIT. It comprises people like us who are industrial R&D providers. There are government grants which will supplement people's own funding. Right, so 50-50 or 80-20 or so government supports research which is heading towards real applications. So I think the entire ecosystem and even the IP filing ecosystem, right? And there are enough attorneys today who will take up, who listen, who are technically competent, who will listen to your uh, novel idea and then they will convert it to a patent application for you for a very reasonable fee, right? The entire ecosystem which is needed to foster innovation is 100% available. In fact, we, I, I ran the innovation session at the Global Investor Meet last year in January 2019, I believe. The government had asked me to run that. And the topic of that panel discussion, the way I had organized it, was on showcasing the various components of the innovation ecosystem that exists right here. And we had actually picked the speaker so that every panelist represents one aspect of the innovation ecosystem. So we had created the panel that way, right? So I think uh, uh, we are not resource limited in that fashion, okay? Okay, now let's come to the topic of money, right? If, if the money is an issue, right, for funding r and I think there are still ways to get around it, right? Uh, there are ways to share equity in that idea, right? And hence fund a smaller portion and get the research done. So, uh, uh, we, so yes, some money is required to start, but then not the full budget because then the reaps, so the reward is kind of shared across all parties concerned. That is one way to share the, uh, to reduce the amount of money required. Secondly, it can all, the innovation can also be done in smaller steps, right? You don't have to shoot for the stars when you start, right? You can say that, okay, I will phase my research program into much smaller ideas. And each of them, uh, the first two phases may be low-hanging fruit, which means that once you finish that, you can make some money out of that, which may feed the future research programs. Okay, and then finally, uh, we actually work with some very small companies who, who in fact, very innovatively fund research into our, our uh, facility. So a very uh, classic case in point is a, is a company in the Northeast, which is uh, making electric vehicles. Right? And they started from scratch. They started from a zero budget. Okay? And uh, they are very much interested in R&D. This is a company that is, uh, I mean, uh, I'm not saying this in, in a negative way. I'm actually saying this in a positive way. They run this factory out of unskilled laborers. Right? People who may not even know how to read. They may be illiterate. Right? What they do is they simply import kits from China. And they, the, the, the uneducated laborers uh, assemble those kits into electric vehicles. And the assembly is done purely based on what fits where, not based on knowledge of how it works. Okay. And just by that, they are able to produce, they are able to sell hundreds of vehicles a month. And they are able to make money. Right. So this is a very, very Indian example where they are into production first and then they want to go into R&D, which is the opposite of conventional thing. Right? So now they want to do R&D on those vehicles because they have realized that those vehicles, those kits they have imported from China have issues. Right? Uh, uh, in China, they probably work well. In India, for example, the vehicle is rated for six people, but there are eight or ten people sitting on it. And it fails. The controller fails. The motor fails. Right? 
so they want to do r and d they want to improve that for indian conditions there are other 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 issues for example the way the motor is mounted on that electric vehicle if it goes into a pothole especially a pothole filled with water the motor gets wet right very indian example so how do you make a motor that needs to be needs to have vents because it needs to get cooled but also needs should not have vents because it cannot get wet from the water so classic innovation problem right so these are very very interesting examples of people with very limited resources right and in this example somehow they have gotten into production and they are selling parts and they are using that cash flow to fund research and what they have told us is every month they'll give us something right so it's not even a, a multi year program even though effectively finally it is a multi year program but it is like uh, every month we'll give you these earnings right and keep giving us uh, uh, keep giving us innovations so which will improve our product right and it turns out that their own customers are also like that because they are selling these are all three wheeler electric rickshaws and these are the people who are buying these rickshaws are people who are uh, essentially looking at how much their money they earn on a per day basis that's the end of the day how much cash they have in hand right and when they accumulate some cash at the end of the day or end of the week they actually come back to this company and say okay give me some more features give me a usb charger on this vehicle give me something interesting right so these are all okay these are all small innovations right small additions but it's still very valid for the indian market so i think there is always a way right so if you can be msme you can be even smaller than a micro i'm smaller than an msme right i mean i have seen people literally sitting on the footpath and assembling vehicles in places like calcutta because that's all it takes to do it yeah right? i guess I, that's truly innovation for everyone yeah <laughs> <laughs> like the topic of the webinar says one just one last question before we close uh, there are three or four questions which are asking that if you work for competitive companies and you do innovation for them how do you manage confidentiality yeah so uh, uh, it is a fact that um, uh, throughout the world most competitive companies actually source from the same suppliers right especially in niche areas so if you look at boeing and airbus right they are the two major aircraft companies you will find that they have mostly a common supplier base so it's not that hard a problem okay but now to answer this question directly uh, this is innovation so ip is even more important than just a manufacturing supply so here we if we find out that there is a direct competition right first at very first level we are very frank with the customer saying that yes we are working for this other party and we give them a high level description of the problem that we are working and we ensure that we are not working on exactly the same problem and we avoid what is called cross contamination of ip which means we have separate teams working for these two partners and we take great we go to great lengths to to ensure that these two teams don't talk to each other as far as that problem is concerned right so there are ways to do it right uh, but then what is ip right see ip is something that you can protect in the end but there are things there are learnings beyond ip which actually can be shared which will actually benefit both parties right so there is also benefit in working for competitors because you may be working on similar problems and there is a certain undercurrent of knowledge which may not be at the level of ip but is at the level of uh, fundamentals and and basic science right which can't be really patented which can actually be benefit when which can be shared and benefit can be derived from that. sure uh, thank you so much dr ramanian i understand that you no know, one or one and a half hours is not enough to for us to get uh, you know uh, you know what all you are capable of giving us but uh, you know it's a matter of great pleasure and honor that you are on our panel of advisors and anybody who wishes to actually have a consulting session on r&d can definitely you know contact us to reach you so that is definitely you know uh, you know a great matter of honor and privilege for us i thank you so much for doing this session for us and readily accepting to do this i now invite mr vm rajasekaran to please uh, you know uh, give us closing remarks yeah if i may i just wanted to close sure 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 uh, by saying that uh, uh, i think the covid situation should not be looked at negatively because yes there are challenges but every challenge the other side of that coin is also an opportunity right i think so this is the chance for us because even the government is pushing uh, 
um, uh, what do I say, uh, less dependence on foreign countries. Mm -hmm. So this is the chance for us to grow organically. This is a chance for us to innovate what we need for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right? So every challenge uh, always is an opportunity. I mean, if, if, uh, uh, if there is a blow to the travel industry, there is a boom in the video conferencing industry. Mm -hmm. Right? If there is a blow to movie theaters, there is a boom in uh, online streaming. Yeah. Right? So there is always the other side of the coin. And yeah. the question is, can we identify that other side and make it an opportunity for us? So I'd like to close. Now over to Mr. Rajeshekar. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Subramaniam and uh, uh, Ram for coordinating this session so beautifully. I think both of you, uh, you know, did this in tandem so well, you know. I really enjoyed it and uh, I thank all of you.